Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy, <clears throat> and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, thank you for joining the group, like, whatever you want to call it, my fandom, I guess. I mean, I only have 10 subscribers, so I can't really call it fandom yet, but thank you for stopping by. Anyways, give this video a big thumbs up, comment down below what you want to see in the future, and don't forget to click that subscribe button. In today's video, we are going to go on to chapter 3 of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. So, I hope that you guys are ready for it. This is your warning. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, click off the video now. You have been warned. Here we go. Chapter 3. It was an emergency. The text said, an SOS emergency. Pip knew immediately that could only mean one thing. She grabbed her car keys, yelled goodbye to her mom and Josh, and she rushed out the front door. She stopped by the store on her way to buy a king-size chocolate bar to help mend Lauren's king-size broken heart. When she pulled up outside the Gibson's house, she saw that Kara had the exact same idea, except for Kara's post-breakups breakup first aid kit was more extensive than Pip's. She had also brought a box of tissues, chips, and dip, and a rainbow array of face mask packets. Ready for this? Pip asked Kara, hip bumping her and greeting. Yep, well prepared for all the tears. She held up the tissues, the corner of the box catching the ends of her curly ash brown hair. Pip pressed the doorbell and both of them winced at the mechanical song. Lauren's mom opened mom answered the door oh the calvary is here she smiled she's upstairs in her room they found lauren fully submerged in a duvet fort on the bed the only sign of her existence a splay of ginger hair poking out up from the bottom it took a full minute of coaxing and chocolate bait to get her to the surface first Kara said prying lauren's phone from her fingers nail finger in her fingers nail was bitten to the quick you're banned from looking at this for the next 24 hours he did it by text, Lorne wailed, blowing her nose and shooting an entire swamp into the tissue. Boys are dicks, Kara said, putting her arm around Lauren and resting her sharp chin on her shoulder. You could do so much better than him. Yeah, Pip broke Lauren off another line of chocolate. Besides, Tom always said pass passively when he meant specifically. Kara pointed eagerly at Pip in agreement. Massive red flag. I passively think you're better off without him, said Pip. I atlantically think so too, added Kara. Lauren gave a wet snort of laughter and Kara winked at Pip in unspoken victory. Thanks for coming, guys, Lauren said tearfully, her pale eyes swollen and puffy. I didn't know if you would. I probably never neglected you for half a year to hang out with Tom, and now all I've been is third-wheeling two best friends. That's crap, Kara said. We're all best friends. Yeah, Pip nodded. Us and those three mediocre boys we allow to bask in our delightful company. Kara and Lauren laughed. The boys, Aunt, Zach, and Connor, were all currently away during summer during the summer break. But of her friends, Pip had known Kara the longest, and yes, they were closest and unsaid thing. They've been they've been inseparable ever since six years old. Kara had hugged the tiny friendless Pip and asked, Do you do you like bunnies too? They were each other's crutch to lean on when life got too much to carry alone. Pip, though only 10 at the time, had helped Kara through her mom's diagnosis and death, and Pip had been her constant two, her constant two years ago when Kara came out. Ready with a steady smile and phone calls into the early hours, Kara wasn't the face of a best friend, it was the face of a sister. By extension, Kara's family was Pip's second. Mr. Ward, in addition to being her history teacher, was her territory territory father figure behind her stepdad and the ghost of her first father pip was the was at the ward house so often she had her own mug with her name on it and a pair of slippers to match kara's and her older sister's naomi's okay kara lunged for the tv remote rom-coms or films where boys get violently murdered it took roughly one and a half terrible films from the net from the Netflix backlog for Lauren to wade through denial and extend a cur cautionary toe toward acceptance. I should get a haircut, she said. That's what you're supposed to do? I've always said you look good with short hair, said Kara. And do you think I should get my nose pierced? Ooh, yeah, Kara nodded. I don't see the logic in putting a nose hole in your nose hole, said Pip. Another Pip quote for the books. Kara fiend writing it down in midair. 
What was the one that got me the other day? The sausage one, Pip sighed. Oh yeah, Kara snorted. So, Lore, I was say, asking Pip which pajamas she wanted to wear, and she just casually says, it's sausage to me, and didn't realize why that was so, that was a weird response. It's not that weird, said Pip. My grandparents from my first dad are German. It's sausage to me, as a German saying just means I don't care. Or you've got a sausage fixation, Lauren laughed. Says the daughter of a porn star, Pip quipped. Oh my god, how many times? He only did one nude photo shoot in the 80s, that's it. So, on to boys from this decade, Cora said, prodding Pip on the shoulder. Did you get to see Robbie sing yet? questionable segue but yes and i'm going back to interview him tomorrow i can't believe you're already started your capstone project lauren said with a dying swan dive back onto her bed i want to change mine already famines and are depressing i imagine you want to interview naomi sometime soon carl looked pointedly at pip yeah can you warn her i might be stopping by next week Sure, Kara said, then hesitated. She'll agree to it and everything, but can you go easy on her? She still gets really upset about it sometimes. I mean, he was one of her best friends. Actually, probably her best friend. Yeah, of course, Pip said. What do you think I'm going to do? Pin her down and beat responses out of her? Is that your t tactic for Ravi tomorrow? Ha. Huh. Morn sat up then with a snort snot sucking sniff so loud it made Car visibly flinch. Are you going to his house then? she asked. Yeah. But what are people going to think if they see you going into Ravi Singh's house? It's sausage to me. Pippa fits in by wing eight one nineteen. Capstone Project, log entry three. I'm biased. I know I am, for reasons I don't even know how to explain to myself. I want Sal Singh to be innocent, reasons carried with me since I was twelve years old, inconsistencies that have nagged at these past at me these past five years. But if I'm actually going to solve anything, I have to be aware of confirmation bias. So I thought it would be a good idea to interview someone who is utterly convinced of Sal's guilt. Stanley Forbes, a journalist at the Fairview Mail, just responded to my email saying I could call at any time today. He covered a lot of the Andy Bell case in local press and was even present at the court hearing when she was declared dead a year and a half later. To be honest, I think he's a proof he's a poor journalist and I'm pretty sure the Sings could sue him for defamation and liable about a dozen times over. I'll type up the transcript here right after. Transcript of interview with Stanley Forbes from the Fairview Mail newspaper. Hi Stanley, this is Pippa. Were you, we were emailing earlier? Yep, yeah, I know. You wanted to pick my brain about the Andy Bell slash Sing Sal case? Sal Sing case, right? Yes, that's right. Do you mind if I record our conversation? Sure. Shoot. Okay, thanks. Um, so first, you attended the court hearing that established Andy as, a, as legally dead, correct? Sure did. Since the national press didn't elaborate much further than reporting the verdict, I was wondering if you could tell me what kind of evidence was presented. Uh, so the main investigator on Andy's case outlined the details of her disappearance, the times, and so on, and then he moved on to the evidence that linked Sal to her murder. They made a big deal about the blood in the trunk of her car. They said they, this suggested that she was murdered and her body was put in the trunk to be transported somewhere else. They said something like, it seems clear that Andy was the victim of a sexually motivated murder and considerable efforts were made to dispose of her body and did detective richard hawkins or any other officer provide a timeline of what they believed were the events of that night and how sal allegedly killed her yeah i kind of remember that and he left home in her car and at some point on sal's walk home he intercepted her with either him or her driving he took her to a secluded place and murdered her he put her in the trunk and then drove somewhere to hide or dispose of her body mind you well enough that it hasn't been found in five years must have been a pretty big hole and then he ditched the car on the road where it was found monroe i think and he walked home so because of the blood in the trunk the police believed that andy was killed somewhere and then hidden in a different location yep okay and a lot of your articles about this case you refer to sal as a killer a murderer and even a monster you are aware that without a conviction you are supposed to use the word allegedly when reporting crime stories not sure i need a child to tell me how to do my job anyway it's obvious that obvious that he did it and everyone knows it he killed her and the guilt drove him to suicide and why are you so convinced sal's guilty Almost too many things to list, evidence aside, he was the boyfriend, right? And it's always the boyfriend or the ex-boyfriend. Not only that, Sal was Indian. 
Well, he was actually born and raised in the United States, though. It is notable you refer to him as an Indian in all of your articles. Well, same thing. He was of Indian heritage. And why is that relevant? I'm not, like, an expert or anything, but they have different ways of life from us, don't they? They don't treat women quite like we do, so I'm guessing maybe Andy decided she didn't want to be with him or something, and he killed her in a rage because, in his eyes, she belonged to him. Well, I... Honestly, Stanley, I'm pretty surprised you still have a job. That's because everyone knows that knows what I'm saying is true. I don't agree, and I think it's irresponsible to p publicly call someone a murderer without using allegedly when there's no con been no conviction, or even worse, calling Sal a monster. It's interesting to compare your reporting about Sal to your recent articles of the Stanford Strangler. He murdered five people and pleaded guilty, yet in your headline you refer to him as a lovesick young man. Is that because he's white? That's not... That's got nothing to do with Sal's case. I just call it how it is. You need to relax. He's dead. Why does it matter if people call him a murderer? It can't hurt him because his family isn't dead. Look, this is a waste of my time. You really think he's innocent against all expertise of senior officers? I just think there are certain gaps in the case against Sal, that's all. Yeah, maybe if the kid hadn't offered himself, hadn't offed himself before getting arrested, we would have been able to fill in, the, fill in those gaps. That was insensitive. Well, it was insensitive of him to kill his girlfriend, allegedly. You want more proof that this kid was a killer fangirl? We weren't allowed to print it, but my source and the police said that they found a death threat note in Andy's school locker. He threatened her, and he didn't. Do you really still think he's innocent? Maybe he is, and you're a racist, intolerant hack who... Stanley hung up the phone. Yeah, so I don't think Stanley and I are going to be the best of friends, but he's provided two pieces of information I didn't have before. First, police believe Andy was killed somewhere before being put in the trunk of her car and driven to a second location to the to be disposed of. Second, this death threat. I haven't seen a death threat mentioned in any articles or police statements. Maybe the police didn't think it was relevant or maybe they couldn't prove it was linked to Sal. Or maybe Stanley made it up. In any case, it's worth remembering when I interview Andy's friends later on. So now that I sort of know what the police version of events are for the night and what the prosecution's case might have looked like, it's time for a murderer map. I have to make a couple assumptions when creating it. The first is that there are several ways to walk from Max's to Sal's. I picked the one that heads back through Main Street because Google said it was the quickest and I'm presuming most people prefer to walk on well-lit streets at night. It also provides a good intercept point somewhere along Weevil Road where Andy possibly pulled over and Sal got in the car. There are some quiet residential roads on a farm on Weevil Road. The secluded places circled could potentially be the site of the murder, according to the police's version of events. I didn't bother guessing where Andy's body was disposed, because like the rest of the world, I have no clue where that is. But given that it takes about 18 minutes to walk, from where the car was dumped on Monroe back to Sal's house in Grove Place. I have to presume he'd have to be back in the vicinity of Weevil Road around 12.20 a.m. If the Andy and Sal intercept happened around 10.45 p.m., this would have given Sal one hour and 35 minutes to murder her and hide her body. I mean, time-wise, that seems perfectly reasonable to me. It's possible. And then it shows her little murder map of Fairview. But here, I've spotted one of those inconsistencies. Andy and Sal both leave where they are going. They are around 10.30 p.m., so they must have planned to meet up, right? It seems too co co coincidental for them not to have communicated about meeting. The thing is, the police have never once mentioned a phone call or any text between Andy and Sal that would equate to a meet-up arrangement. And if they planned this together at school, for example, where they wouldn't be no record of the conversation, why didn't they just agree that Andy would pick Sal up from Max's house? It seems weird to me. That is the end of chapter three. I will see y'all in the next video. Maybe it'll be chapter four, but I hope that you guys are enjoying these. Bye.